Poverty is not just the absence of money, but the absence of opportunity. And the United States is a country where you have both freedom and abundant opportunities. I'm moving to the United States as giving me both. I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria. I came from a close-knitted family. I was the third of four children. And the best thing that my parents gave me was the gift of education. Even though I came from a poor family, they gave me education with the instruction that this is the tool that will help me to dig my way out of poverty and ignorance. But what my parents did was that they instilled in us the value of faith, hard work, and not giving up. They made us realize that if you put in the work, you will definitely get the reward. I came without a dime in my pocket. All I had were big dreams, determination to succeed, and the resilience. I got my first job at the age of 14. My job was on the construction site. My duties were to move concrete on a large pan from one end of the construction site to another one. I worked on that day from around six in the morning to about seven at night. At the end of the day, the employer refused to pay me. And the reason was because she did not authorize the foreman to hire me. So I worked from sunup to sundown and didn't get paid. That tore up my spirit. And from that moment on, I decided that I was gonna become a lawyer. And I was gonna use every ounce of strength within me to fight against injustice, regardless of how powerful the opponent is. I am a man that worked my way up from nothing. I know what it means to feel like you're being unfairly treated, and I'm the person that can stand up to opponents regardless of how big or how powerful they are. Welcome to another episode of Legal Angle with Emmanuel the Law Holowale. I have with me today, Judge Julie Lynch. She's a judge of the Court of Common Pleas in Franklin County, Ohio. Welcome to the show, Judge Lynch. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes. And can you please tell us more about yourself? Who is Judge Lynch? Well, you know, listening to the introduction and listening to your life story, here's what's interesting to me. You're from a different continent. You grew up in your lifestyle, but our stories aren't really that different. Um, I uh, came from a large family. I'm the youngest of seven. And um, in our house growing up, uh, my father was in recovery for alcoholism. And he got in recovery in the 50s, actually before I was born. But our house was a home in which on Friday and Saturday nights, Back in the 60s and 70s, um, people had AA meetings in their homes. And my father created a very special room in our house where people from all walks of life, all colors, all genders, uh, could come to our house on Friday and Saturday nights and they had a place that was safe and they would play cards all night, basically. Um, and so in my home, we were a religious family. We were a religious family more than we were a um, political family. And social justice was a very big part of our family. So people of, in the 60s, people of color were our friends. They were in our homes. People from different gender identifications were our friends. They were in our home. And my mother was one of those mothers that whoever you brought in the house, she'd fix food for. You know, that was, that was how we connected. Um, but as life went on, I, um, I went to Whitehall Yearling High School. I went to public school. I graduated when I was 16. I, um, between 16 and 19, I worked for my dad in his office and, you know, just did, my dad was a realtor. I just answered the phones and did some things. I got married when I was 19. I never went to college even though in high school I graduated with honors, I graduated 10th in my class. Um, that was, I didn't come from a family in which education 
uh, was a priority. And uh, I got married. I had three children. Um, my husband came home one day and the marriage was over. I didn't realize I was expecting our fourth at the time. I had no money, zero. And because I came from a Catholic family, when my husband left, my family did not support me because two of my sisters were married to two brothers who were my husband's cousins. So it's not very different, is it? Like, that's how, that's how it goes. And so I had no support. I had no financial support. So I just drove to Ohio State University. I went into their continuing education department. I signed up for one class. It was a theater 100 class because I'd been out of high school for a long time and uh, school had already started at Ohio State. So all the basic education requirement courses were full. I uh, realized my second quarter that I was expecting and I just couldn't quit what was there to do. So I went through uh, Ohio State. I graduated with honors. I had my little girl. I took her to school with me for five and a half months until she started talking too much. And um, I graduated with honors and I went on to law school and I completed law school and my undergraduate degree in five and a half years. And um, then uh, that was in 1993. In 1995, I was in mayor's court in Whitehall. I didn't know the mayor. And when I was done with my case, the mayor asked me to come back into his office, and I did. And he asked me to run for Whitehall City Council. I was a single mom. I had just come through law school. It was very, you know, as you know, law school is, is difficult. And... Um, I wasn't even sure what kind of a commitment being on city council would be. I wasn't sure what my responsibilities would be, but I thought to myself, this sounds like an opportunity. Just say yes. I knew nothing about it. I had no political ambition. It was not in my uh, consciousness and I ran and I won. And then I ran for reelection for city council and I won. And when I was on city council, when I was listening to the city attorney, I thought he was giving the city very poor legal advice. So I ran against a very popular city attorney. And in Whitehall, all the races are nonpartisan, which means you do not have to declare a political party to run. But the first three people I beat, we were of the same political party. When I was a city attorney, I got appointed to the municipal bench in Franklin County by then Governor Taft. And I uh, lost that race, my very first race uh, countywide, I lost. But I was fortunate enough that I did so well in that race. I only lost by 2% by a very, very long time, big political name family. And uh, so I was afforded the opportunity to run for the Common Police Court that very next year. And I ran and I won and I've been on that bench for the past 18 years. Um, personally, my first 18 years on the bench, I was a Republican. Four years ago, I changed political parties and it's been, a, it's been the first three years were fine. There was, no, there was no problem. I was part of the Franklin County Democrat Leadership Council uh, but then this year when I ran, there were, there was a problem. I don't know why. I don't know from who. And nobody has ever told me. But the Democrat Party did not endorse me. And I had to run the primary uh, without endorsement. And I won the primary handsomely. And um, now I'm up for re-election in the fall. And, and the party is still irritated that I won. And so I'm still not on a slate card. So this has been an interesting thing. You got to understand, I've been on this bench for 18 years. In 18 years, I've ha had approximately 20,000 felony cases. I have never been reversed once. I've never had a hung jury. I've never had a disciplinary complaint. And I've never been sued. So I'm not sure what the deal was, but... All along that, I also have done 30,000 civil cases. I have been reversed seven times in, on the civil cases, but that's negligible, you know? Uh, 
it has been my, it's a true, it's a true honor. It's a true honor to come from nothing and to, to be able to be in a position where I can help our community, help individuals who want help. You know, you, you're a lawyer, you understand that not everyone who needs help wants help. Correct. And, and, and you also, you can, you can lead people to help, but you can't force them to take it. Correct. And so for me as a judge, philosophically, uh, when I see people that have alcohol abuse, drug abuse, mental health issues, I come from a background uh, of addiction and help. You know, uh, m one of my older sisters, she started in the late 60s, uh, the Allen Alateen program, which were for teenage children of alcoholics. And it's, a, it's sort of like, Alcoholics Anonymous, Al-Anon. It's where teens could go and talk about what was going on in their homes and get support uh, in living in alcoholic environments. So I come from a family, a long time family of, of recovery. And so I understand the difference. You know, in your opening, you were talking about how education is the great equalizer. And so is, so is recovery. You know, people who get in recovery uh, do amazing things. And um, it is one of the things that I try very hard in my court to recognize uh, and to afford people the opportunity to engage in uh, recovery programs, mental health programs. And uh, another uh, big thing that this year uh, something that's become very important to me is education. It is the difference between poverty and not being in poverty is to be educated. So I met um, a group of uh, educators who have second chance high schools. And those are for people who have dropped out of school, people who, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen the GED test to get your uh, graduate equivalency diploma. It's hard. It's hard. And uh, the math portion on that's very hard. And so what happens is there are programs out there for people that I care about. For me, I care that somebody who's not educated, if they have the least inkling of wanting to be educated, that I can help them on that journey. Uh, it's what changed my life around. You know, when I first uh, ended up in college with my children, I had to uh, use public assistance for three years. I was on welfare for the first three years. So I've, I've come from a position where I had nothing, had to do what was necessary to get my education and to take care of my family. And as a result, I have four amazing individual, you know, my children, they're a much better version than me. My children have grown up to be educated, uh, stable, in great marriages. And my oldest son is a Catholic priest. Everybody is just, it's it, it, by, by you know the grace of God, my family uh, was able to not only come through uh, a unexpected negative situation, to blossom into being responsible, wonderful, funny individuals. Uh, I also have six grandchildren. And let me tell you something, they're even better than children. I have, uh, my oldest one is six, and then I have three that are four years old, and I have a two-year-old and a three-month-old. So I'm head over heels. So if you want to know who Julie Lynch is, she's a grandmother, and I love it. It's my favorite thing in life. Wow, that's wonderful. You're not only a grandmother, you are the mother of a Catholic priest. Yes. And your upbringing, having to deal with a father who was dealing with addiction, gave you that understanding and compassion for defendants or plaintiffs or anyone in your courtroom who might be having mental health issues and addiction issues. Now, the flip side of that is this is called balancing fairness in tough justice. There are times when, when tough justice is required. It's Correct. required because you gotta understand as a judge, I take an oath 
And my oath is to you and to everyone listening to this and to everyone in the community, whether they're Republican, Democrat, voters, non-voters, it doesn't matter. My job is I represent everyone in this community. And pursuant to uh, my job, I take an oath. And an oath is a very, very serious commitment. It's not just a promise. It's deeper than that. And I take an oath as a judge to uphold the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the state of Ohio, and the laws of the state of Ohio. That means a lot to me. But pursuant to statute, my job is described as twofold. First, to protect the public. Second, to rehabilitate and to punish the defendant. And so I take public safety very seriously and so there's been some cases in my career, you know, uh, there's only two judges on this, this bench out of 17 that have been there for 18 years. And so in 18 years, justice has shifted. You know, back in, back, you know, 18 years ago, it was very much law and order. And now it's moving, it's morphing into law and order, but now we recognize that there's programming available that can change the trajectory of people's lives and take them out of the criminal justice system. So now it's a balancing of trying to rehabilitate people and give them the opportunity to have a fresh start in life uh, as opposed to just incarcerating people. Now, there are uh, many factors, for example, and you know this as, as, as a lawyer, uh, when it comes to murders, and this is something that is plaguing our, our society right now, the penalty for murders are established by the legislature. They're not established by the judge. So murders are, it's, it's a very interesting thing that uh, the legislature would say, here's what you do in murders and take that discretion, that judicial discretion away from a judge. Uh, but uh, I've had over the course of my career, I've had some of the most horrendous cases that have taken place in Franklin County. And for a while, I just wondered who I made mad because I was getting 90% of them. And so those cases are the ones that are still running on court TV. And, you know, I, I've been on court TV for, for one case for 16 years. It still runs. It's known as the, uh, it was a big outburst in my courtroom and it's been on TV. And you know, last two years ago, I sentenced a, a man who had raped two young children. And that sentencing went viral. It's had over 15 million hits. And um, those are because those are the kind of people that create true trauma and harm in our community. And incarceration is the appropriate. Thank outcome. you. Thank you. So now instead of just law and order, we have law, order, and compassion. Correct. And, yes. and as for you, your story started in kindergarten when two, some of your classmates were sent to the corner because they asked for a party break. How did you know this? That is the craziest thing that you know that story. Johnny Sugar and Peter Cereal, those were the two boys sent to the corner. And I was yes. four years old. This is so funny. You should know that about me. And at four years old, I went marching up across that room and put my hands on my hips like I was in charge. And I told that teacher, I was like, you are not nice. They need to go to the bathroom. You need to let them out. And instead, she put me behind the door with them. And one of the little boys had an accident, and I never forgot that. And you know, what's funny is I ended up as a judge, and I ended up as a prosecutor before I was a judge. But always in my family, though I was the youngest, my siblings always came to me to argue anything they needed to my parents. I'm always, I was always the one, still the one, that tries to help the underdog. Because I... Just there was something in my brain, and I don't know, it could be a disease, but I have virtually no fear to articulate on behalf of someone else's needs. Much more so than my own needs. It's not a disease, it's a calling. 
Maybe, maybe you are called like Moses to advocate for the downtrodden. It, it, it may be, but you see, as a judge, I'm not an advocate. You know, I'm not an advocate. You're the advocate. Yes. I, am, I am the one who listens to it all. And I am the one who tries to do the right thing, do it with compassion. Do it. And you know what? That's been a learned thing. As I, over the course of 20 years, people evolve and I've evolved as a judge. Exactly. When, I first, when I first started out, I was a little hot, you know, I'd come off hot because the sense of injustice to what happened to the people in my courtroom overrode my sense of compassion. I had compassion for the victims and not as much for the defendant. As life has as, as as life evolves and you change and you see what's in front of you, uh, I became more compassionate towards the defendants as well because they have their story too, and so many of them have never had the stability in a home. They've never had two parents that teach them, you know. And and so while you cannot excuse violent behavior because it's it, it fractures an entire community you can still see the human personage in that person standing in front of you do you know what's very interesting to me is as i've gotten older and as i've uh, heard more people's stories it is always uh, an amazing thing to me when defendants come to my court on big cases, little cases, and no one is there to support them. They're in that court by themselves. And, you know, sometimes they're 18 years old who have committed murders, and there's no one. No one. And to me, that to me is heartbreaking. Now, you do have the other ones where their families are there as well. And, you know, it's just, and unfortunately, in some of those circumstances, family members have been in and out of the institution, incarceration. And so it's not so scary for those people because these kids were visiting their dads in prison. And, you know, I mean, uh, a lot of you, you and I both know that socioeconomic circumstances will cause people to do things that they would not do if they had the appropriate means to live. Yes. And um, you were raised by parents who uh, either, I, I'm not sure if both of them were World War II veterans. Yes. Or you, were. you are How freaking me out. Like? You are freaking me out. Yes. My mother, my mother was in the Navy and in, in World War II, they had waves that were women in the Navy and they had wax that were women in the uh, Army Corps. My mother was in the Navy and my father, he was just in the Army, uh, but they were both World War II vets. What was that like being raised by two veterans? So you got it. So my mother came from Holmes County in, in Ohio, which is now almost completely Amish. But back when she was growing up, they were farmers. So, you know, 30 years ago when you started in politics, whether you were Democrat or Republican, everybody had the same basic goals, and that was faith, family, and country. Those were your three major ideological uh, uh, positions. It's very different today, but what happens when you have parents that are both military backgrounds is that um, they have a great sense of patriotism. And so I grew up in a home that was very strong in patriotism. Patriotism is different than politics. Patriotism is loving your country for all the opportunities it gives you for the, for the ability to live in a country in which people follow laws. You know, I've traveled all around the world and you know, when you travel, it, it's just a great way to learn acceptance and to find different cultures interesting. But I'll tell you, if you've ever, if you've ever traveled to Egypt or any of those kind of countries, 
there isn't a traffic law anyone follows. It is just India, India. To get from the airport to wherever you're going, you're pretty sure you're not going to make it because it's just there's the there's just nobody who abides any traffic rules. But we live in a country in which, on our own, we obey the law as a whole. You know, there are those who who don't, but as a whole, and it's and it's it's that sense of of uniqueness that uh, people who aren't born in this country always want to come to this country because there's opportunity and it's different than many other places in the world. And being in the military instills that, you know, that love of things like the flag, you know, I mean, just a symbol, it's a symbol. But so I grew up in a home with both parents love this country very, very much. They love the country to the point where they served in the Great War, the World yep. War II. And, you know, going to law school, you decided to go to law school after four kids. What was it like? Juggling well, law school with four children. And let me tell you. Oh, I'm sorry. Going through a divorce. Yeah. Well, and, you know, uh, my so six weeks into law school, my youngest was being potty trained by me. And I remember, I just, I just said, I can't do this. I had finally bitten off more than I could chew. And I called my parents because I was just, I, I was immobilized. First of all, I'd already taken out the loan for law school. So you're already indebted, right? And, uh, I remember I was in the bathroom and I literally, my head was hanging over the toilet because I just felt sick that I just couldn't do it. I, I couldn't be a single mom with four kids, very limited support from my family, uh, all kinds of craziness. And my parents came over and my dad took one look at me like with my head in the toilet, four kids running around. And he's like, you got to quit law school and you got to just come work for me. And so basically what he was saying is I could be a secretary and that's no disrespect to secretaries. My secretary is amazing and she can do things I don't even know how to do. So it's no disrespect to, to secretaries. But what it was, was a disrespect to my abilities. You know, I had the ability, I graduated in two and a half years. I had one declared major and one undeclared major, which means I, I graduated with two majors and two and a half years and had a baby. And, and, and my dad was like, come be my secretary. And I just sat up and I said, no. And I lifted myself off that floor and I brushed my shoulders off. And I said, I'm going back and I'm not quitting. And I went back and I didn't quit. And uh, that first year of law school was not a pleasure. <laughs> I will assure you of that. It was difficult. And, you know, fortunately, I have the kind of mind that if I hear something, I can, I, I have a good ability to, to retain it. Because let me tell you something, you know this as well as I do. Having four children, having them in school, and the amount of reading you have to do in law school uh, my youngest was three years old and I'd be reading her case law to go to sleep at night so I could get the, the reading done. But just like everything else, at that end of that first year, that accomplishment that I made it through, it became easier the second year and the third year. And, and uh, you know, here I am 30 years later. Oh, that's very impressive. And you were raised in a Catholic family. And, you know, the Catholic Church is against divorce and annulment and things like that. What was it like for you having to go through a divorce as a Catholic? Well, that's where the hardest part of that was my family. Like, they just stepped away from me because nobody had ever been divorced in our family. Uh, and I got to tell you, just to, 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 I'll answer that question, but I do want you to know that Interestingly enough, after I became a lawyer, my family came back around. 
<laughs> and to this day, you know, that's 30 years ago. That's water under the bridge. Uh, my siblings and I are all very close. Uh, but uh, it was scary to them. It was scary to them because most people who are in married uh, relationships suffer hard times. And so if divorce is available, hard times that you could get through, if that wasn't available, people bail and, you know, they end the marriage. And so when I first, when we first split up, my siblings were all nervous because they didn't know what that would look like for me. They, and, and mind you, uh, I never got remarried. So I was only married once. I've been divorced over 35 years. And, um, you know, you have a crisis of the soul. So while you're also trying to take care, while I was trying to take care of four people that meant the world to me, and I was bound and determined, just so you know, if you ask me what my vocation is, I don't say the law. My vocation is a mother. I had to find a job that I could support five of us on. And so the only real gift I had was I was always a voracious reader. From the time I was 10, I used to read a book a day. And, and you know, they were like Nancy Drew books. You know, they were, they were children's books. But, I mean, I was a voracious reader. And honestly, I was a voracious reader up until I became a judge. And then my reading started slacking. And I, to this day, people are like, you used to read all the time. I'm like, uh, I just want to play on my computer. Leave me alone. Uh, but uh, it was, it was one of those things where I didn't know if God hated me. You know, you go through all these ex 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 existential things, worrying about what it means because any person who has a faith, we all believe there's something greater out there, whatever your faith is. And so if you believe there's something greater out there that you're held to accountability, but you physically can't see it, you know, you physically don't hear it, your mind can go all different places. And it did. I was just worried that you know, I was going to go to hell for, for it. I, you know, so you've got all kinds of things going on while you're trying to still maintain a home. You're trying to maintain your grades. You're trying to do all the things. I was the only person in my law school and I didn't do, go part-time. I went full-time day. There was nobody else in my law school class that had four children, let alone single with four children. So when people find my personality aggressive, it's because I have tiger blood in me because I had to take care of my four children and that became my priority. And so there, it, there wasn't enough time to sugarcoat everything. You had to get those kids where they needed to be. They had to get educated. They needed their you ever have four kids in four different sports at the same time? At one point in my life, I had a kid playing college basketball, high school basketball, junior high basketball, and elementary school basketball. Now, how do you get to all those things? You can't. I could not. So my older children, my two older children, rarely had their mother at any of their sporting events because I, I, I couldn't do it. The younger ones demanded I be at their events. And so, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a challenge. My first two children, my two older children, literally, if there hadn't been other mothers to take them for me to and from places, it would not have happened. And so I have always been so grateful for the friends that came and helped me. And, um, you know, it, it made the difference in my children's lives. Now, all four of my children are, are and now two of them have their own families. And when you're a Catholic priest, you're a father to all. 
they now recognize like the sacrifice and and I I get cards just spontaneously sent from my children that say, oh, mom, I had to do this today. And I just think back, how did you do this? I have a husband. I have support. We only have two kids. Like, you know, they're just, you know, I get the accolades now. Though I got to tell you something, my children, because whatever I've set out to do, I have done successfully. They just believe that whatever I set out to do will happen. And I'm just like, no, you don't understand. It's hard to win a race. It's hard to do this. And they're like, oh, mom, you, you say you're going to do it. It's going to be done. I, I'm just like, I don't know. I've created some monsters. You had to be tough because you, you did it alone without a lot of support. That is correct. That, that itself instills some kind of discipline and strength that, because you know that you can depend on anyone. If no, if no one is, if you don't do it, no one is going to do it. So it become tough survival. That's, that's, and that is an accurate portrayal right there. Uh, so while if people think I'm abrupt or brought, listen, I understand myself better than other people. I am abrupt <laughs> and, and I am abrupt because I come from a very large family and, and, and that uh, there's just that interaction when there's 12 people in your home that you got to get in there and get it. And also when you're by yourself raising children, you got to also be the drill sergeant. And so, uh, you know, I used to tell my children that my home was not a democracy. It was a dictatorship and I was the dictator. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So let's check out a clip. Then uh, we'll talk about it. Okay. This court is so sick and tired of seeing adults ruin and abuse children. These are literally just one step from being babies. They come to a daycare, those parents struggle so that when they release their children to someone during the day, they have some semblance that that child is gonna be protected and safe not let alone two of their children being raped by your own admission, sir. For sexual gratification, you violated a four-year-old and a six-year-old. I do not know at this time what the total ramifications will be for those two young children, but there isn't anybody who doesn't understand now the developmental phases of children take place from zero to six years old. You can't even know what damages you've done for sexual gratification. This to me is so mind boggling that you used and abused two little children like they're, they're, they're inconsequential beings. Those are human persons with human dignity. The mere fact that they're small little people that can't fight off adults, that's why an adult left them with adults. I'm going to tell you something, Mr. McFadden, there's no free rapes in my courtroom. On count one, I'm sending you to prison for 11 years. On count four, I'm sending you to prison for 11 years. They will be consecutive to each other for a total of 22 years. You have 32 days jail credit. Um, at this time, the court finds it necessary to protect the public from future crimes, to punish the offender, and to find that consecutive sentences are not disproportionate to the seriousness of the offender's conduct and to the danger the offender poses to the public. Folks, if you see it, you smell it, you know it's happening, you report it. These are little children that are the future. I hate to sound so cliche, but the children are our future and if we're destroying them, we have no future. And this ends in this courtroom. That'll be all. Uh, fines and costs are waived. Wow, you were very passionate in that video. What was going on in your mind? One, I am a passionate person, and I don't think because I'm a judge, I should hide that I'm a passionate person. You know, it is what differentiates 
differentiates me from other judges. You know, um, when I first got on the bench, I, there were only two women and there were 15 men and, uh, you know, rarely make a comment, you know, they just sentence, but it comes from my soul because children are being ruined and children are being desecrated and children are the future. It's, you can't, you can't destroy little people and expect them to grow up to be great parts of our civilization. When you break a child, it's very hard to put them back together. And, and for such selfish reasons. You know, when I first got on the bench, you never saw little tiny children being raped. You just didn't see it, you saw adults. Today, now you see biological fathers raping one-year-olds. It's, it's, so for me, I feel that not only is it my job to discern what your punishment should be, but I also feel like I'm the voice for the community. And the community, the community has supported me for 30 years in elected positions because the community likes it. The community believes that that's true, what I say, and they believe it's authentic. It's not a show, it's not, it. listen, you know what? In today's society, prayer is not a popular position. It's not. People, if, if, if you believe in God, people think you're either a far right or, you know, they, they, they got all kinds of things. But you know what? I say a, a, a little prayer before I take the bench every single solitary day. I ask for guidance, I ask for wisdom, I ask for justice. And then I let my heart speak. And that's what happens. Thank you. And you're currently handling the case of the man who raped a 10 year old girl that had to travel to Indiana to procure an, an abortion. That news is both national and international. Oh my goodness, uh, after the um, no bond hearing, I had friends in uh, London who sent me the front of the Daily Mail. It was it was it was on the cover, uh, you know, um, yeah. And all that is random, you know. The, you know, it's all random selection of judges, computerized. How do you handle such pressure? Well, I pray. I turn my life over every morning to a higher power. I ask for guidance. I ask for wisdom. I ask for compassion. I ask for true justice. I mean, I, 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 I try at the end of the day to leave it at the courthouse too when I come home because it would be the stuff that keeps you up all night. You know, and there are times when I have to say this, I've never had a sentencing that I've ever gone home and second guessed. I've never stayed awake over a sentencing I've given. I have stayed awake over sentencings I'm going to give. Just running through things in my head before that. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, one of those things where I will tell you, it does change, this job does change uh, your perception of society. For example, my two little twin granddaughters uh, started preschool this year and they were gonna be out of the domain of their home and their parents. And, you know, I literally had to sit down and talk to my daughter about, you know, teaching my grandchildren, stop my body, my space, I will tell. You know what I mean? It, it, you just, that's the society we live in now. You just can't, you have to be vigilant. And even with vigilance, you can't stop things. You know, I mean, so I, I just try to handle it by, you know, breathing, meditating, praying, doing the things, uh, you know, service, service to others. You see, when you get out of your own self, and you start serving a community, 
it it fills a huge uh, place for your mind to go. So it's not just uh, having a monkey mind. You know what that is? You know, where it just keeps coming back and coming back. So I try to serve my community. Thank you. And you are known for, you know, you have a reputation for being tough as sentencing defendant. How do you balance this toughness with fairness? Well, you see, being tough is not the problem. It's only a problem if you're not fair. You see, so I am fair. So to be tough, and let me tell you, you know, being tough just means that I see a defendant, I've gone through their pre-sentence investigation, I've gone through their history, I've gone through their records, uh, and there is a time for toughness. And I don't shy away from being tough, but I've never been not fair. And you know, it's interesting, as I have been out on the campaign trail this summer, I've run into defendants multiple times <laughs> on my Facebook, I have my Instagram, I have many pictures with me with defendants who come up to me. And you know, I ask every one of them when they come up and say, hey, judge, I was before you. I ask the first question I ask, was I fair? And uh, so far, everyone has said, yes, you were. And they have been incarcerated. And uh, the very first time I ever ran into a defendant, I was at an Ohio State football game and he was parking my car. <laughs> And uh, when he saw it was me, he says, oh, my gosh, Judge, you sent me to prison. Well, that's kind of a shocking thing when you're not expecting that. And it was a, I just turned to him. I said, well, did you deserve it? And he said, yeah. You know, so, uh, you know, fairness is not not um, reacting over extraneous things like, for example, color of your skin. Uh, your nationality, your gender identification. Being fair is looking at the crime, looking at the impact on the community, looking at your record, looking at the opportunities you've had to correct your behavior because most people are not first time offenders. And they, they've had interactions with the court before. They've had the uh, privilege of probation. And, you know, um, for whatever reasons, they have, uh, you know, recommitted, recommitted crimes. So I don't shy away and I don't even think it's a negative thing to be called a tough judge as long as you're a fair judge. Thank you. And how do you address the issues of mental health and addiction in, in your courtroom? Well, there, therein lies the, the, the true um, accessing to programming that, you know, most of uh, the programming that we can offer comes through our probation department. And so, you know, when they're assessed, you know, you go and you have them assessed, you have them assessed for mental health. And so you have professionals who are also giving you guidance. Like I don't pretend to be a doctor. I'm not an, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not in, anything to do with any of those. So in different mental health situations, I send them to NetCare, I send them to Twin Valley, I have them evaluated by professionals who deal with this all the time. And I get their recommendations on uh, what would be most likely to help this person either get stabilized. You know, you gotta understand there's a lot of people on medication and medication does different things to different people. And so there's a lot of people in the mental health field that uh, or services, people who uh, utilize mental health services that get put on medication that does stabilize them, but their side effects. And eventually uh, when they're stabilized long enough, they get tired of the side effects and they think, oh, I've been stable a long time. I don't need these medications anymore. And they go off of them and then they decompose and then they end up back in the cycle of whether it's violence, whether it's crime, whatever it is that happens when when they're destabilized. So I try to stay uh, very in tune. I have kept the same probation officers for years. Uh, 
18 and they, they know what I want. They know what to look for. They bring me new programming. I ask all the time because you got to understand the program available 18 years ago and the programming available today are completely different. So you got to stay abreast of what's out there. Now we do now have a mental health court that the, there are all kinds of specialty courts out there, but you got to understand in the general jurisdiction division, it is incumbent upon each judge to know what services are out there. You just can't, you can't defer to the mental health court because that judge can only take so many people. And you got to know what's available. You got to know um, where, where you can um, find services that will be beneficial to the people in front of you. Thank you. And you left the Republican Party after 41 years. Now you're running for re-election as a Democrat. Go Correct. Change. So there's a couple of things. Just like everything else, you don't think the Republican Party's changed in 41 years? That's, it's, and is it 41 years? Yeah, whatever it is. The, the party that, when I was 18 years old, is not the party that it is today, or whatever year it was I became a Republican. Clearly, you know my back better than I do. Uh, but um, I'm going to tell you there were a couple of circumstances that uh, pushed me to make that statement. You got to understand, as judges, we're not allowed to criticize. There, we are. We are bound by canons and codes and where you know you have to always have that in mind but uh when um the speaker of the house was taken out again in handcuffs you gotta understand he was 10 years ago the fbi came in took him out in handcuffs and when he came back i was horrified and then you know um his uh one of his lobbyists um had a case in my courtroom and he was a Republican and he was, uh, he was uh, a partner in the biggest lobbying firm in the state of Ohio. And it was the former head of the Democrat party in him and they were partners and he stopped paying income tax, employee tax, federal tax, and the partner didn't know. So now there are millions of dollars in arrears in taxes and they had the the case came before me and at the end of that that man um it got very nasty with me because he felt that because i was a republican judge and he was a republican that that it, i should have ruled in his favor and that just told me what i needed to know about his ethics and his values now Unfortunately, and I don't wish this on anybody, he did commit suicide during the pendency of this investigation in the House Bill 6. Um, but I watched all that, and, and, and then I got to tell you something. In my world, gun violence is prevalent. And, you know, the, the rulings coming out of the State House regarding guns just has torn my heart up. You know, it just is now we had that case in uh, Tuttle Mall where the guy just pulls a gun out and shoots somebody and, you know, says it was self-defense. And I mean, the the miscommunication to the public regarding guns now is so prevalent that it's very scary. Everyone, you just got to assume, has a gun. And so there were decisions like that that just went against my nature. I also support immigration rights. I also support different, um, you know, I support uh, women's, women's, women's uh, wage equality. A wage equality for women will bring, I really believe that could turn so many domestic violence situations. You know, women stay in situations because they don't believe they have an alternative because they have no resources available financially. You know, and even if they have second homes in the job, they're not enough to support a family. So there are many things that uh, I've evolved into. If you don't evolve, what, what's the point of living? And, uh, you know, so 
it has been my greatest disappointment that for three years I was in the Democrat Leadership Council. I had a little card from the chairman. I got a letter every year, judge, thanks so much. And then out of nowhere, I have no clue, blindsided. You know, the chairman of the Democrat Party called me on October 30th, and I know it was October 30th, 2021, because that's my birthday. And uh, you should have known that with all the things you know about me. Uh, but, uh, you know, he said, Julie, get your petitions uh, ready for Tuesday night for the Victory Party. Come get your petitions filed. Get your first fundraiser going. So I did what the chairman asked me to do. And then I went to the screening and they basically had a setup for me. I was completely set up and they did not, uh, they did not uh, recommend me for endorsement. And the party chairman called me, said they didn't recommend you for endorsement. I said, well, Mr. Chairman, that does not work for me. I'm 62 years old. I have one more term left in a stellar career uh, before I retire. And he said, well, he said, we, he has, we have a process. The night of the screening, you can have somebody um, put your name in and somebody second it, and then they'll do a floor fight. I got an outstanding lawyer who's in the Central Committee. He's also an elected local official in a suburb and uh, another, and they were going to do my floor fight. An hour before that meeting, the chairman calls me and said, we've changed the rules tonight. You can't speak. I'm like, okay. And then they got up in that meeting and they said, we looked at four criteria for our endorsements for judges. First, experience. There's nobody on the judge bench who has more experience than me. Second, electability. Nobody has been elected as long as I have. Third, uh, judicial philosophy. You can't have a judicial philosophy until you're actually in the trenches as a judge. You can have a theoretical philosophy, but, you know, anybody can say anything until you're in the trenches and then you develop your philosophy. My philosophy is give them help where they can be helped and incarcerate them where they can't. I mean, it's a simple philosophy. And uh, I never can remember the fourth one, but it doesn't matter because this is what the chairman of the committee said. But for Judge Lynch, we didn't use any of those. And there, he's like, um, we just think that um, she wasn't truthful about why she left the Republican Party. I, I can't even tell you how, and that was that night. Then the next time they got up and they said, well, she doesn't share our values. Well, she, and then it changed. Every time they said something, it was a different reason. And then finally, someone just said, we don't like her. I'm <laughs> just like, I, I have no words for any of that. But I will say this, a lot of the Republican judges have changed. No one else has had this kind of back flack. But in fairness, they've only been municipal judges or domestic relation judges. No judges who incarcerate people. And the truth is, I incarcerated uh, from two elected officials one was a secretary to an elected official. Her son committed armed robbery. And it was a joint recommendation from defense counsel and probation. The, I mean, uh, prosecutors. The victim agreed. The defendant agreed. They all agreed to what he would plead to and what he would be sentenced to. And they came to me and they said, Judge, we have a joint recommendation if you will consider it. And I did. I took it. And it was for four years. And I didn't really think that, you know, considering he committed armed robbery, I felt like, that was a very, very, very fair sentence. And then another one, um, it was a man who had no record. In all honesty, he had no record. But uh, during the day on state time, and he worked for a state agency, he was found with 16 pounds of marijuana in his car. And he told me, he said, Judge, my wife likes to smoke a little marijuana. And I said, well, you know what? I might have, I might have been born at night, but it wasn't last night. So I'm like, I do not find 16 pounds of marijuana personal use. And he said, well, and I get it for some other friends. Well, now you're turning into what's called a dealer. <laughs> but I sent him to prison 
he could have gone for eight years and I sent him for one year and a half. And I, then I let him out and the minimum's two years. And they went nuts because I incarcerated somebody over marijuana. And I didn't incarcerate somebody over marijuana. I incarcerated somebody who worked for the state on state time with 16 pounds of marijuana who just told me he was a dealer. Thank you. And there are some out there, especially rumbling, that believe that you switch party so that you will win as a Democrat in Franklin County because a lot of Republican judges have been losing. What do you have to say to those people? Well, if that was the truth, I would have quit the race when I didn't get their endorsement. You see, I already won without their slate card. And what they were saying is I won it on their slate card so I could win. But I won and I wasn't on their slate card. So if I only wanted to be on their slate card and they didn't put me on their slate card, I would have quit. But see, here's the injustice to me. I'm allowed to be whatever party I want to be. I don't have to ask anybody for permission to change my political affiliation. So to want to punish someone for changing party affiliations is bizarre to me. But you know what? They made their decision. I went ahead and I ran and the people in this county like me. And guess what? If that was still the truth, I would still quit because I'm still not going to be on their slate card. Thank you. What do you want the voters of Franklin County to remember about you when they go to the polls in November? That I care about each and every person who lives in this county. And I get up in the morning and I go to work every day so that our community can be the safest, best, healthiest community out there. And I will spend the rest of my life fighting for us to live in freedom and peace. Thank you. And, you know, you've been answering questions, educating the public about yourself and what you do on the bench. What does it mean to you to come on this show, Legal Angle, to speak to the public? First of all, it was just such an unexpected privilege to meet with you. And secondly, I have so much respect for you who do this so that the community can get to know, uh, first of all, their rights, to know what's going on in the legal community. You have the class and the taste to introduce judges to them. And uh, I, I feel that I was presented a gift and I thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for coming on the show. It's been an honor to have you and to have this conversation with you for the past hour. Thank, Thank you. And for those of you watching us at home on your tablet or computer or listening to this as a podcast, we thank you for your time. Until next time, stay safe and stay blessed. And vote Lynch. <laughs> Bye for now.